but nothing happening. It's just grunts and groans without achieving the purposes of God in my speech. Look at Luke chapter 11. The third book of the New Testament, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verses 11 to 13. Now suppose one of now suppose one of you fathers is asked by, the, by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He says, a good father doesn't give their kid a snake or a scorpion. Now, wh 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 what's a snake or a scorpion? Look back at chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. So serpents and scorpions re represent the power of the enemy. So it's the devil after you, it's demons after you, or demon-inspired people after you. He says, those are serpents and scorpions. You know we call people a snake in the grass. That's a scorpion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a negative scenario. He says, I will give you authority over them. But that authority comes by means of the Holy Spirit. But how do I get the Holy Spirit? He says, ask him. He says, ask him. You mean it's that easy? Oh yeah, it's that easy. This is easier than you think. He says, if you have the Holy Spirit, that's the assumption that you have him, you're a Christian. He says he responds upon request. Okay, you go to your car. You got the body of your car because you can sit in it. You got an engine, so you got the power and you got the vehicle. But you also have a key. Now the key, little small thing, you slip it into the ignition, you turn it on, you got the motor on so you can go somewhere. Oh, wait a minute, all I did was turn the key and the power erupted. I just turned the key and boom! I turned the key and I can go from zero to 100. I turned the key and I got all that power just by, hmm. I don't have to get deep. I don't have to get deep. All I gotta do is ask him. He says, and when you request the presence of the Holy Spirit in that hour, as on, on an as need basis, he says, I will give you authority because he has authority. I, I love the way uh, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 40 says it. In Isaiah 50 verse, excuse me, Isaiah 50 verse 4, uh, Isaiah says it these words. He says, uh, he says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. Oh, wow. He said, God wakes me up. He starts talking to me in the morning so that I know how to use my tongue today. In other words, he wakes up in the morning and he says, now my request is that you will speak by your spirit through my lips by putting your ideas in my mind as I speak and audibleize them as I need them. He starts his day off invoking the Holy Spirit to use his tongue. The, the Bible calls this concept to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. He says, be not drunk with wine, which is destructive. He says, be full. I do want you to get drunk, but not with wine or Jack Daniels, or Hennessy, whatever you want to do. He says, don't be drunk with wine, which is destruction. He says, I want you to be filled with the Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit. Okay. Last time I checked, there's only one way to get drunk. Right? Oh, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know anything about it, but I know a lot of y'all do. Be not drunk with wine. There's only one way to get drunk, drink. <laughs> you drink, you know, and you drink, and the more you drink, the drunker you get. And we can, we can know when you, we can know when you, we can know when you're drunk, because, because, because you're acting outside of your normal self. You're stammering outside of your normal talk. You are, you are, you're stuttering outside of your normal movement. Why? Because something else has taken over. Something else is now in control. And when the Holy Spirit starts governing your speak, you, speech, you're going to know it because you're going to say, where did that come from? I wouldn't normally have said that to that person that way. I wouldn't have normally related that way. But the question is, do I just want to vent or do I just want, do I want to accomplish his will with my words? If you want to vent, you can do that all day. Do that all day. But he says, when you request the fulfilling of the Holy Spirit, when you request for God to govern your Tongue, when you request for God to be in your gums, for God to be Lord of your lips, when you, when you invite the Holy Spirit, he says, he will meet you at the need in that hour. Even though you haven't pre-thought it or know what you're going to say. Every time I stand up here before Sunday, I say, now Lord, have your way with the sermon and take it in the direction you want it to go. So three illustrations that I gave you in this morning's sermon was not planned. The car wasn't planned, the engine wasn't planned, uh, 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 the playbook wasn't planned. Uh, that came as he spoke to my head in the midst of the sermon to give me what I didn't plan to say. So I had my thought about what I was going to say, but I gave him the freedom to fill the moment with what he once said, so he gave me stuff I wasn't even thinking about talking about. I, I wasn't going to talk to y'all about how drunk some of y'all get by drinking. He said in that very hour, on an as-needed basis, day by day, and sometimes it's moment by moment. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit's got to call an audible. This, this thing went left. And so the Holy Spirit, and sometimes you can't even say it with your lips because, because uh, now folks think you're crazy and you talk in two talk conversations in the middle of one. Sometimes you just have to say it with your heart, with your mind. God, give me, give me, give me, what, what do you want said now? But that relationship, and, and see, it's in this everyday stuff that God becomes real to you. It's in this everyday stuff that you're not just going to church and hearing the sermon, but you're hearing God talk and deal with you as an individual Christian because the Holy Spirit is the means by which Jesus makes himself real today to his believers. Let's look at one other scripture. I love this one. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah, the great prophet, in the year that King Uzziah died. It says Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up with his train filling the temple. He saw the glorious God and then he heard something. He heard the angels. And when he heard the angels, this is what he heard. He said, the seraphim stood above him in verse two with six wings. Two, they covered their face. Two, they covered their feet. Two, they flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. He said, I heard them worshiping God in the temple on a bad day because it was in the year King Uzziah died. They were, if things weren't going well, this is, this is a bad year for me. The king has died. But that's when I discover the king is still on the throne. He says, and stuff started shaking all around me in the temple. 
And then I said, verse 5, woe is me. I am ruined. That means coming apart at the seams because I am a man of unclean lips. Woe. When I saw God, I saw my mouth. And my mouth was dirty when I saw God. Then he says, I dwell among a people of unclean lips. So my mouth is dirty and their mouth is dirty. But you know what? You can be around dirt so long you don't feel it's dirty no more. That's why we be laughing at the kings of comedy. That's why we be... Oh, oh I shouldn't have said that. That's why we be... That's why we be getting into to some of the most wretched kind of humor going but we get so used to the unclean. And then we wind up not only laughing at it, but throwing out a little bit ourselves. Because our lips get unclean because we're surrounded by uncleanness. And I hope you notice that younger and younger and younger, the kids are cussing now. What you wouldn't have heard till college became high school. High school became junior high school. Junior high school is now elementary school. If you don't watch it out, a kindergartner will cuss you out. Because now they're surrounded by a people of unclean lips. Every television program, they're using the words now and they're throwing them out so it's become regular. Things you would not think to say bounce off of us now because we are unclean lips. We're surrounded by people with unclean lips. But you don't know that until you see God. He says, on that day when I saw the Lord, I was reminded of how evil my tongue was. And that's not only profanity, that's putting people down, that's gossip, that's, that's tearing people up, ripping people's character apart, using my tongue to hurt other people. It can be a whole different way, but everybody's doing it until I see God high and lifted up. And I understand my lips are unclean and he's the prophet, he's the preacher that can't control his mouth. It's how deep it had gotten. And he says, when I saw God lifted up and when I saw how the angels talk, I said, woe is me. Sometimes it comes out when you're complaining when you ought to be thankful. Complaining about what you don't have when you have what you do need. You spend all your week complaining and hardly a minute giving thanks. The person who said, I complained that I had no shoes until I saw the man who had no feet. I changed what I saw. It's like the monk who went to the monastery. The monk went to the monastery and uh, he did the monastery and, and that was a place of silence and serenity. And so in this particular monastery, you could only say two words once a year. Only two words once a year. So he went to say after the first year his first two words to the head monk. I don't know if that's the right phrase, but the man in charge. <laughs> so he went up to the head monk after the year and he said, bed hard. Bed hard. After the second year it was time for his next two words, food bad. <laughs> bed hard, food bad. Came at the end of the third year for his next two words, I quit. I quit. Chief Monk in charge said, well, I'm not surprised you've been complaining since you've been here. Because <laughs> sometimes our mouths are used in a way opposite to what the Holy Spirit once said in a given situation. And when your mouth is used opposite to what God wants to say in a given situation, God's will is not being worked through your words, so don't expect it to work out. That's why you can fuss for years about the same subject and nothing improves. Because God the Holy Spirit was never in the conversation, so the conversation carried no heavenly clout. God didn't change anything because your words were not his. Because when he talks, worlds happen. When he talks, light enters darkness. When he talks, peace comes where confusion abounds. If he's allowed to speak. 
But we do to him what we don't want our kids to do to us. And that is talk while we talking. Don't you hear me talking? Don't you hear me talking? I'm talking now. But we allow our speech to be so loud we do not hear his voice. And we watch our speech achieve nothing. But more fights, more conflict. As James 4 chapter says, he says, you fighting all the time, you quarreling all the time, y'all mad at each other all the time. Why? Because you are so worldly and so out of touch with me that my influence is not being felt in your situation. But notice what happens in closing when he confessed about his lips. Then, then after he acknowledged that my mouth's not right. Then, verse 6, one of the seraphims flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Some of us need to put our mouths on the altar. I told our folks last Wednesday night, a lady came to her pastor and said, Pastor, you convicted me with your sermon. I want to bring my tongue to the altar. He said, lady, we don't have an altar that big. <laughs> Some of us, if we told the truth, we have filthy mouths, ungrateful mouths, evil mouths, conflicting mouths. And we said we were going to do better. We meant we were going to do better with any divine involvement. Some of us are worse now with our lips than we were before we ever got saved. But he said, when I confessed about my lips, he took the tongs off the altar. That's hot coals. He took the coals with the tongs off the altar and put them against my lips. Now, you know what that did? That hurts. Lips are some of the most sensitive parts of the body. You ever burnt your lips? That thing hurts. That hurts when you burn your lips. He put hot coals on his lips in order to burn away the evil talk. And your sin is forgiven you. And why is that important? It's important because of verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? He got instruction from heaven on how to now move, move ahead in his life because he was now open to the voice of God telling him what to say. In other words, your tongue can block God giving you your direction. Your tongue can block God from giving you divine guidance from showing you what to do next. Because you know so much and you want to talk for yourself, you guide you. But now if you want the God of heaven to speak to your mind so that he informs your mouth what to do with your tongue and express with your lips. If you want God in your gums and the Lord over your lips, then I can tell you how to direct your life. Because it's such a small thing he says, can direct the whole horse and can direct the whole ship and it can direct the whole life. I want you to stand to your feet and just bow your head. No one moving. We're going to dismiss in just three minutes. But if you need to confess your tongue, your mouth, tell God now, God, I have used my mouth wrongly. I have contributed to the problem. And maybe you are dealing with a Pharaoh who is an evil person. Then you desperately need what God once said. Maybe there's a couple because you fight all the time, you want to get divorced. You fight all the time. When now, if the Holy Spirit leads the conversation, he can bring order to a chaotic communication. And now maybe you need to reconsider that divorce. Maybe you have an uncontrolled tongue. You just say what you think. You just throw it out there. You don't care about the pain it causes because you just got to speak your mind. But now you understand God wants to be, he wants to be the editor, your speechwriter. 
And if you have a special struggle in this area, I want to pray with you. Come on down and let me pray with you. If there's a special struggle in this area, but you're putting it on the altar, you're letting God address it, you come out. If there's a couple that needs to come together, you come. You, you come. Let's, let's put God in your mouth. You know if it applies to you. No one moving but those coming because I want to keep this as a sacred moment.